Hello everybody. Hi. Welcome to the January edition of Toronto Jug. We've got a mailing list where we announce our meetings and rarely discuss anything, although everybody's welcome to post, so. <laughs> we could discuss, yeah, somebody posted something. Um, and our Google Plus community is actually doing better than the mailing list. Uh, few people have started contributing news items, interesting stuff. I found a really interesting link that Dan posted about um, how to pass our code review by some angry person who blogged in an angry manner. But <laughs> I, I agreed with all the stuff he said, so I wasn't angry when I finished reading it. Um, and we also record videos of all these talks. And you can find the link to the videos on our website, tjug.ca slash videos. So Java News, thanks to the people on the Google Plus community. I cribbed almost all of this stuff from there. So there's a new Java update, as usual. I think we've always got one of these to mention. This one has a best before date. It's going to get angry if you try to use the web browser plugin after April 15th. And then apparently it gets really angry if you try to use it after May 15th. <laughs> so that's neat. Uh, and most of the changes, including that one, are related to security fixes and security enhancements and trying to prevent uh, attacks basically that come through WebStart and applets. Uh, and it also breaks Guava, the Google general purpose Java library, because they changed something about type variable impl, which implements a public interface called type variable, which is part of the reflection API. Uh, you can't anymore make another implementation of type variable that compares equals to one that the JVM made. Um, that actually affects the framework that we make, because we're using Guava to resolve type variables. So this will probably break our stuff. It might break yours, too. Uh, speaking of security enhancements, uh, I think it was Dan who posted this to the Google Plus group. This is just an interesting rundown of uh, <laughs> why Java is an excellent attack vector if you want to take over somebody's computer. Uh, so make sure you keep everything up to date. It's basically the only way you can stay safe. You can see this in detail in our Google Plus community is posted there. On uh, more positive news, this is the uh, uh, histogram of the top searches for skills on the Stack Overflow job site. And Java is a clear leader there. This was out of uh, 14,000 queries on the careers 2.0 search engine last year. Um, by far, most in-demand skill was Java. Suck at PHP. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Where's Ruby? Is it just above it? Or? Where's Rails? Rails made the top 10. Ruby did not. Yep. Python beat Rails. Um, there's some new stuff from JBoss, uh, where, where I work, so sorry. Um, <laughs> Are you buying us all beer for this uh, talk? Nope. You can, plug your, you can plug your ears if you don't care. Uh, Forge 2.0 Final came out today. Uh, Max has been developing a Forge plugin against Forge 1 point something. <laughs> so he's, he's not the happiest person in the world about this announcement. Because uh, they changed the API, but now plugins can collaborate more easily, so that's good. And the Eclipse integration is much better. What's that? Are the docs I, Docs? <laughs> what do you mean? There aren't no docs. <laughs> there aren't no docs. Just going to answer your question. Yes. <laughs> also, Keycloak 1.0 came out last week. That's a new thing. Um, it supports a whole bunch of security APIs. Uh, so you can use it for SSO. It implements OAuth. It supports cross-origin resource sharing. And um, 
It's got a whole bunch of social login brokers for Google+, Facebook, and so on. Twitter, I think, is one of them. Uh, so it's very easy to configure all this stuff because it's supported directly. Uh, it supports TOTP, which are those uh, Google Authenticator tokens, and a lot more stuff. So that's one to check out. Is that related to Picket at all? Or is it, it uses Picket Link, but it's a higher level API that builds on it. Uh, and you don't have to deploy it to JBoss. It can be deployed in any WAR file. Uh, and there's a Java Calendar website. It's, there's too much content for me to post here, but it's pretty cool. So somebody's created this site. You can submit stuff to it. I noticed that our Java 8 tutorial day is on that calendar. Um, Java2014.org. It's a calendar. So now, on to our main presentation. Christian and Donnie are going to introduce us to Scala. OK, let's get started. We have quite a lot of things to show, so we have a tight schedule. But please feel free to interrupt us if you have any questions so we can <coughs> elaborate. So before we start, a quick show of hands. Who here is already familiar with the basic Scala syntax? Uh, it's just a few. OK. Well, I guess we've prepared for the right level of difficulty. So we'll start right from the from the lowest level and then go up. Um, so what is Scala? What are these uh, core design principles? So first of all, it's a JVM language. So it compiles to bytecode. And it was designed for seamless integration with Java. So from Scala, you can access fields of Java objects. You can implement Java interfaces. You can extend Java classes. And likewise, you get access from, from Java code to Scala, obviously. And it's a hybrid language. It's both object-oriented and functional. So everything's an object, and functions are first-class objects in the language. Um, a big uh, motivation was to cut down boilerplate. So Scala is a very expressive syntax. And it also uses type inference to keep your, short, your code uh, as short as possible. And it eases concurrent programming. Um, by having built-in concurrency constructs, Java has it as well. By offering the uh, message-based concurrency model, the actor model, and most importantly, by defaulting and promoting an immutable, just in general, immutable state. So the first release of Scala was in 2003. It's since been growing in popularity. And this is a very famous quote that always comes up. Uh, James Gosling um, said that if he were to pick a new language right now, it would be Scala. And we also see that a lot of big and very famous companies are, use, are using Scala, and they've been using it for a while now. And that's about all the slides, for me at least, right now. Um, I want to switch to actually showing some code. Can you all read that? Is that big enough? Yeah, no, this is Yeah, OK. All right, so the first thing to introduce the basic syntax, we have three ways of declaring stuff three types of declarations. One thing is a val. You find the type in Scala comes after the name. That's not like Java. It's always after the name. And we can say, I don't know, John. So what is a val? A val is basically a value, a variable that can change. <laughs> so we cannot do this right now. So, so this shouldn't compile. And it doesn't. It will tell me reassignment to val. And if you define a case class, and we'll see that later, by default, it's all vals. So it's immutable. You assign a value, and you can't change it. This is obviously really good for concurrency, because you never have to synchronize shared state. Right? So a val doesn't change. The second way of um, declaring things is a var. As you can guess, this we should be able to comment this out. So this is wrong. And uh, this we should be able to change. <laughs> Again. <laughs> right, so this compiles. So name two is now Christian. So a bar can be changed. This is a general variable. And the third type of declaration is def, a method. So we can say def, uh, say greet, give this parameter, 
So now we have a method and just say print line name. I'll try Donny's name now so I don't misspell my own. <laughs> <laughs> so if you invoke this, we now see it printing Donny. And of course, this could return a type, which we could specify here with a colon. This is the return type. So it's, which, of course, I should have returned something then. And could just say return any string, or just have the string be the last line of the method body. Uh, I don't need to type return. So this is a very basic run through through the uh, uh, syntax. So now the first part of the presentation, we're going to look at Scala as object oriented. So we look at some object oriented features. Um, so let's define a class. Um, give it a first name and a last name. Now you should be able to say, well, p is new person. But that looks very familiar. That's basically not so much different than in Java. Now to access a field here, we can say uh, p first and p last. Now for Java developer, and for me in the beginning, this was very weird because we're actually doing a direct field access. But for vals, that's, remember, that's a, a field that cannot change. It doesn't matter that you access the field directly. You can share that object. You, there's no, in Java, we get so attached to this getter method. If the, if the value can actually change, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. But of course, if you want to, uh, you can make these vars. Now you're in the mutable world again, potentially the world of pain, if you're not careful. And you have two fields that you can change. And for the fun of it, I'll give it a third one that I'll define here. Call that age integer initial to zero. Um, it gives me a chance to show that the type information here is actually optional. I can remove that. I'm not sure if you can read that now. This is still an integer. Um, not because it's dynamically typed or anything. This is actually an integer compiler because the compiler infers the type based on the uh, right-hand side. So zero is just by default an integer. Is that a java.lang um, No, it's not. The string it's actually is, isn't it? String. The string is a java.lang string, but the integer is not. OK, so let's add getters and setters to this, because we're used to it. Um, what I'll do. I'll explain that in a second. I'll rename those fields. And is totally like Thank you. Tony, you was <laughs> <laughs> he probably cringed in the background. Why, I didn't <laughs> 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 yeah, so I can't, I can't get used to it, but yes, you don't need this okay. at all. Thanks. Good point. <laughs> it's a reflex. <laughs> <laughs> it goes away. <laughs> yeah, you keep saying it, but it doesn't happen. Um, OK, so let's define a getter. So we have a getter now. And I have to look up the syntax more well myself, because I can't remember. I'll quickly add this. Uh, I need that. And say underscore first equals value. Should be correct. Do the same for last <coughs> oh thanks and of course here you want to return last and it isn't thanks so what we see now is what's called the uniform access principle. The client-side code actually still compiles. That's the same code, we didn't change that. Only this time it's using getters and setters. So if I should be able to say uh, p first equals, yes, that's correct. <laughs> and last equals, and it looks like direct field access, but it's really using getters and setters now. 
So that, that detail of how you get to that field is completely hidden from you. And to see that we're actually invoking that, we should print something in that getter. So do a print line. Brings me to, uh, to the next feature, uh, string interpolation. So if we have a string, we can repaint it with an S and then say first name was set to, and then use a dollar sign to access fields of the enclosing scope. Do the same for last name for now. So this. And now we see that we actually, looks like a direct field access is it actually invoking the setter method. And yes? Is there a significance to the underscore in the first underscore name? In, in which one, in this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the idea is I think that the method name can contain a space. But that makes that uniform access principle possible. So that underscore and that name, that's correct? It's special names about when you do p dot first equals whatever, it's really calling p dot first underscore equals and passing in Christian to it. Right, so yeah, so it makes this part. Oh, I see, okay. Got it, okay, yes, I understand that. So that, <laughs> the point is that you can start with a variable, you can just have var first. So you overloaded the equal there, in a way. Yeah, you just made your own uh, getter and setter for it, but you can actually have uh, an assignment where it looks like that. I don't know if I'm to be scared or impressed with Scala about this. It really ends up working well because you start with a variable when you need to, yeah. and then instead of having to make a getter and setter for right. nearly everything, and then when you want to actually put behavior in it or validation or anything, then you change it. Oh, so I in 99% okay. of the cases where you don't. So, so, that's, so this is considered like a Scala design pattern? Yeah. Or is that like a feature of the language? Yeah, I would it's a feature of the yeah. language, the, the uniform access principle is something that some languages. So the feature of the language is that in a name, underscore is treated as a space? Is that No. So an underscore is not treated as a space. It's just that when you do p dot last equals, it redirects that language. It's a special case. So, so here, here's the part that I'm still not understanding about the syntax. Can you put line numbers on and I can actually ask my question more intelligently? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> which references are uh, whatever. I think you're asking about why did he rename the variable? No, no, no. Like uh, the def that says def first underscore equals value, right? Def. So on that one there, it's first underscore equals. Um, and then you're saying that when you do the p dot first equal to Christian, that that the the you said like the underscore means that the function can have a a space in its name. Is that is not what you said earlier? May have said that earlier, but so really what it is is there's a special case of where you do p dot whatever space equals space some other argument. Yeah. It will change that into the method called p dot first underscore equals passing in that thing to it. So presumably so it, it's just one special case. You don't change all spaces. In so so that language. special case is a feature of the language. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it makes that uniform access principle possible. So that the field access and the access over getters and setters look exactly the same. So okay. that you don't have to change your client like the calling code when you decide to introduce a setter. And presumably if you put two spaces there it would still work, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Yes, it does. But as many as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so you're redefining an operator, though. Right. Um, first equals is an operator? Well, we'll get to that later you, if, you, if you we have the time, but that. it's. This yeah. It's a little bit different, but it's kind of like that, yeah. Think of it as, as the p dot first equals is calling set. You can write out the method but p dot first equals pass in the word. And what it's actually doing the first one is. Yeah, so you could do this. That's what you mean, Donnie, right? Oops. Yeah, coming. Those are equivalent. It just turns one into the other. You need that space. I was going to ask you, yeah. you need that space? Yeah. Like, yeah, you can you do p dot last equals? I'm pretty sure we'll no try space. to call a method literally named last equals. Right. Can you try it? Can you try it? Go ahead. Do you want to do p dot? <laughs> no I'm space. No space. space. I'm pretty sure it'll save this guy? No fields. Yeah. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, I was going to ask the other question. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jonathan tries to break it next. <laughs> where, okay. where you're defining first underscore equals. Oh, OK. If you put a space this there, one. does that break? Yeah, yes, okay. that will break. That was OK. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> OK.
just make your fields immutable, then you're in a happy. <laughs> I, can, I can get behind that. See? <laughs> I knew you could. OK. Um, there's one more thing. Oh, yeah, I remember now. So we saw string interpol interpolation, which is nice. But we can also use triple quoted strings. So I do this. <coughs> and then I can, it will automatically escape. So you can enter new lines. And I could say the well, full name is do a dollar first and dollar value. And I can also put that into quotes, which I don't have to escape because in the triple quoted string, they already escaped. So this is full name is my name. So quite a nice feature. OK, so that's a basic, um, basic class. But we can do a lot better. Let's remove all this. Yes, don't need this. So I've prepared something. You all know this. <coughs> so this is a Java class person. He has four fields. One of the fields is optional, the middle name. We have some minimal constructor telescoping. Yes, if there's multiple optional fields, we could use a builder pattern. And then we have all the getters and setters. We have a hash code, an equals, and a two string. It's a lot of ceremony, a lot of stuff that you don't actually want to type. You usually have your IDE generate that for you, which I did in this case. And in Scala, to achieve the same level of functionality, you can use a case class. You can say case class person and give it a um, field string, last name, and I believe an age field. So it's hard to believe, but this is actually other than the middle name, which I'll introduce shortly, this is actually functionally equivalent to that other class, to this guy. So we can take a look. We define a person. We don't even need the new operator for case classes. Um, define person. So here we see we already have a two string on that thing generated. Uh, let's define a second one. And we can also show that the double equals operator is actually invoking the equals method. So these two objects are identical. Because what we, what we get is an, an equals method generated. Uh, we get a two string generated. We also get a hash code generated. And p equals p1, because the double equals operator is doing a value identity, not a reference identity. So how do you do a reference uh, comparison? I believe you can do this. Am I correct? Yeah. EQ. So and this is false. Because normally what you want is real value quality. So it's much easier to read with the actual equals. Just go through your Java code base and search for equals. Then you know why they did this. Yeah. Uh, There's more than <laughs> one occurrence of equals in your code base. But it's something to get used to. But yes. What is the new? special case for case classes. Like, can you, if you, if you do, uh, initialize a non-case class object? Oh, yeah. That's a special case for case classes. But it's still created on the heap, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it's you can, what, why you can do you the same thing if you want, but case classes have it done automatically, where you can do that without any. So, okay. Think of it as just calling a, a static factory creation method, which, which you can call. What, what makes it a case class? Take the word case here. No, no, I was <laughs> what, what extra properties or special properties would a case class have versus a regular? Sorry, I didn't hear that. What special powers does it have? The special powers it has, it will, the compiler will generate a equals a hash code to string. And okay. what are our special powers? Every field by default is a val. So those are all vals. I didn't have to type that. They're all immutable. Okay, well, okay. And because it's immutable, one thing that you often want to do is you want to make a copy of it. But you want to change one or two fields. So it generates a method called copy, where you oh, yeah. can just pass in the fields you want to change. You can also use it for something else that he's going to show you. Yeah, I'll show that in a second. So could you could you have just eliminated, like, said so John, comma, 60, and made one of the, the parameters optional? That's the next step. Ah. <laughs> Good question. So let's add that middle name back in. Uh, just a question. Is for the, uh, for the equality, uh, can you also use, uh, if you wanted to, could you use dot equals? Yeah, you can. Yeah. It still works the same way. 
Yeah. Exactly the same. It, this is actually invoking the equals method. Does it work for all classes or just case classes? The dot equals method or the equals equals? Equals equals. That's for everything. Okay. Scala y equals equals redirects to dot equals. OK, so now we have a middle name. And that's, an, uh, that's a default value. So we don't have to specify it. And we don't need to add a separate constructor if we wanted to. I think that was your question. And the next thing we can do. Actually, can that wasn't my question. OK, sorry, what was your question? Uh, if you go back to the Java class, the person.java, mm -hmm. you had every possible combination of the constructors. No, so I only had those two. Uh, okay. Well, you had the, oh, I see, OK, right, OK. I didn't okay, cheat. Okay, no okay, cheating. OK, all right, fine. <laughs> No, my question I know what you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> so what you can also do is use the name parameters. So we define another person, um, and we can say define the last name first. Uh, what's the next one? And this still comes out as John Smith. So if you were to provide a default value in the case class, then you could use just any combination thing. Will, will Eclipse do autocomplete when you're, when you're filling that out? Um, no, not yet. That's, that's just a feature of the Scala ID in Eclipse that they will have to build in. Yeah, um, do I'm not that. using it every day, so okay. if Tony says no, it doesn't no, do it. But not yet. <laughs> you will be able to later when they add it, which is too hard. But I've heard there are other IDEs out there that are better. <laughs> just. <laughs> For Scala. <laughs> 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 exactly. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the final case class feature <coughs> I want to show is a little more involved. So I'll type ahead. I'll define a trade. A trade is basically an interface with superpowers. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, Donnie will show that in more detail later on. Okay. <laughs> So let's give this person a first name and a last name to keep it short. And then I'll define a case class, a student, sorry, that should have these two fields. And extends the person. That's correct. So we add another one. Say the teacher, and superhero. This guy will also get a superpower. And then we need one more, and then we're done. Is Barbara Liskoff going to be impressed? I don't know. <laughs> I don't dare to venture a guess in this case. And we'll have, you're right. OK, so the feature I want to show is called pattern matching. I want to define a method that brings superpowers. You will get a person as a parameter. And what it will do, it will match and then say case superhero. So the superhero has first name, any first name, any last name and some superpower. <coughs> too many characters? No, it's just, <laughs> this is way too <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to print the first name and say has and then print superpower what's it called? Ability. And for all other cases, I want to print um, what about print that's almost Java, what I'm going to do now. OK, so we should match superheroes, and we should match any other type of person. And if we define two persons as a student, Call them John Smith again. Oops. And the superhero. 
I guess Colin. And need some superpower as well. Um, it's, I don't know. And it's level five, whatever that means. <laughs> so let's print superpowers for the student. So it tells us students have no superpowers because it matches everything else, not a superhero. And we can say print superpower for the superhero. And it will print Tony has superhuman reflexes. So we can match on the type, but we can go a lot deeper. We can actually match on, on the type and actually on values of the actual fields. So if I were to introduce a case here to say student, and all students that have a first name of John, and any last name, and then I could print say um, you're a John Mr. Um, last name. You should actually match the student because the first name is John. So it will now bring you a John Mr. Smith. So I can do a complete pattern matching expression on the objects I pass in and go all the, all the way deep down just to type. So this is a really powerful feature that gets used a lot in Scala programming. Can you use that S? Four? Oh, here for. Oh yeah, I hope so. Should be able to do this. Yeah. Okay, so that's for my first part. I'll hand over to Donnie now. So I'm going to talk about Scala's collections library. So. Scala has probably the best collections library of any language that I've seen. And part of what makes it really good to work with is it's got a ton of useful functions that you can use. Mainly the higher order functions are ones that make the code a lot shorter than it otherwise, otherwise would be. So a higher order function is one that takes another function as a parameter. So let me show you that. So we've got some numbers. And what I want to do is multiply each of them by 2. So there's a function called map. And this has nothing to do with like a Java util map. It's more in the mathematical sense of transform something into something else. So think of it like a transform function. And what it's going to do is make a new list. It's going to call the function that I pass in for every element in the list and add it to that new one and then give it back to me. So the way you can specify a function here is by you give it a name, you make this kind of arrow out of an equals and greater than sign, and then you pass in the body of the function, which is number times 2. So when I do that, we get everything multiplied by 2. Everyone understand so far or have any questions? Okay. Now there's a couple other ways of doing this shorter ways or alternative ways that I'm going to show you because I'm going to be using them a lot later on. So if we don't even care, so we're giving this a name number and using it right away, I could call that anything I wanted. Or if I don't want to give it a name, I can just use underscore again. So that stands in for you know give it a name, and then the body of the function is immediately using the name and then multiplying out that too. So, so you can use that. Because you, because you only have a single variable? Yes. All right. If you have a function that, uh, if you need to pass in a function that takes multiple variables, you can still use the underscore syntax, but only if you use each parameter once. So if I had a function that took in two ints, and I, I could do underscore times underscore, and that would be valid. Because the, the first underscore is the first parameter, and the second one is the second one. So, uh, so you can, like, where that would be if I had a function that took two parameters. For this, if I do underscore times underscore, then it will complain because there aren't two variables, only one. So this is kind of useful. Sometimes you want to give it a name because it makes the code more clear. But when it's really short like this, it can be clear enough just using underscore. So another way of doing the same thing. 
is if we already have a function that does what we want, I can do that. So because this function takes exactly what we want and gives us some result, I can pass it in like that. And that's kind of short for giving it some name, and then the body of the function is calling double it with that parameter. But you can do that instead. So does everyone understand this so far? Because I'm going to be showing a lot more like this. So if you're lost, you need to ask questions. Everyone good? All right. So I'm going to show you a bunch more useful higher order functions, and then I'm going to give you, give you a puzzle to solve using them. So right now I've showed map where we start from a list of integers and we end up with a list of integers, but you don't have to do it like that. I could do oops. I could do that and I, and I get back a list of strings. So if I had you know, people objects, I could do the same thing, <coughs> getting back a list of people. So another one I'll show you uh, is for each. I can just print out all of the numbers. And what for each does is just loop over all the elements in the list, and it calls the function that I pass in for each of them. Let's see, another one I'll show you. If I have the numbers and I want to get back only the ones that are greater than 9, I can pass in a condition. And I just get back those. So for each seems like it might be useful, but you don't actually use it as much as you might think, at least if you're trying to write more functional code. Filter and map are ones that I use a ton. What does for each do? Like, does for each take a function? Yes, for each takes okay. a function. It just seems like for each does similar to what map does, but map returns something. Uh, yeah, for, for each doesn't, doesn't give back. Okay. Yeah, for each doesn't return anything, and map will actually transform it. So, so realizing side effects. Yes. And that's why you don't use much in functional code. So for example, if I were to do underscore times 2, I can do that, but I just get nothing back. Right. So those have been easy so far. Let me show you one that's a bit more complicated. Yep. Why is it only printing three as a number and not the rest of them? It is, but that's scrolling off of this side. So it is printing all of them. <laughs> so. so I've got a bunch of strings. If you use an equal sign instead of a minus sign. And what I want to do is group all of these strings based on some property that they have. So let me show it to you. I'm going to group them based on their length. That's kind of hard to read. So what I get back from calling that is I get a, a map of integers to list of strings. So I can show you how we can grab that. So that's how you can access an element in a map. You just put brackets and you put the key for it. So we have the two ones that are of length 5, of length 7. So you can do, you could group by whatever you wanted. If I wanted, I could do it by the first character, for example. And if I did, you know, by character and I passed in a T, I would get back the two testing ones. So, so what is a group by doing again? It is calling the function that I'm passing in, underscore dot length. Yeah. And then it is giving me back a map of that to lists of things that have that property. So all the things that are so the, have a length of five. I got the yeah. result of underscore dot length becomes the key in the map. Yes. And it just accumulates all the I may as well just uh, show you another. Mm -hmm. Is it to, like, it's a, to a list of things? Yep. Like the values are less. Let's go to Yeah, we write that all the time. Oh, but we don't, yeah, we don't think group by. 
Yeah. yeah. So this is me using it a different way. And we get all the ones that are that are starting with T. So this you don't use it that often, but when you do, it really saves a lot of time. Yes. I have a question for you. Yep. Earlier about the ones that says uh, the number is dot map underscore plus is a number. Mm -hmm. How come it only printed out three is a number? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. It, it printed out all of them. It was just off screen. Ah, okay. All right. Deja vu. Sorry, what was that? All these functions are inherited from the base collection. All these methods are inherited from the base collection. Yes, all of them are inherited from a base collection. So I'm only showing them on list, but if I had a set of things, you can call all those. If you have a map, you can still call all those. And there's one implementation that's shared between them all. And the collections are all immutable, you said? Scala has both immutable and mutable collections. Okay. By default, when you're writing list, it imports the immutable collections. But if you want, you can import the mutable collections. And how would, it, how would the code be different? Yeah, it, would, it would be changing the list in place, I think, instead of giving me back a new list each time. I think, I'm not sure. I don't actually use the mutable Scala collections very much. So let me show you one more, and then we're going to the puzzle. So an easy one. So we can check, is there any string that has a length greater than 5? Yep. Greater than 10. Nope. So that just goes, loops through all the elements and calls this uh, predicate to see if it's true for any of them. That's the, that's the classic for loop where you break when you find a true. Yep. And it does that. Instead, it looks like that. So let me. So notice that it's making a map of things to lists of things. Yep. Does that mean that Scala doesn't need a multi map because it's more awesome? Or a multi-map? Like, multi-map in Java takes away the drudgery of having to check when you're adding to a multi-map. You don't have to check if the key already has a value. You create mm -hmm. a list for the value and then add to the list. Um, it's just a multi Okay, so uh, yeah, I got it. Multi -value. Um, let's make a... Sorry, can you ask the question again? I don't think everyone will get very Oh, it's that... Uh, like in Java, we often use libraries like Guava to provide us with a multi-map type where a key can map to zero or more values. Uh, but I noticed that here Scala is creating a map to key and list of, of value, uh, which is the way we would use Java util map because we don't have a multi-map, but it's inconvenient in Java. Because when you want to create the first value in a multi-map, you have to check to see if the key maps to something and then create a list and add the thing to the list. So there is quite an easy way of doing that. Here I'll make a mutable map. We have, um, this is kind of weird syntax, but this is just a way of saying this is a key, this is the value, and we're adding in a few of them. So I take A and I add one to it, and it's off the screen, but trust me that it is six. Uh -huh. If I were to do uh, something comprehensible, if I were to do that, mm -hmm. I'll get an exception because that doesn't exist. Right. But what I can do is Scala has a method called with default value. Ooh. Uh, what's the? Ah. <laughs> it's control space. Control space. It's control space. <laughs> ah. That's terrible. So if I do that, now it will actually work. Neat. And if I were to print it out again, let's just grab that one. So you can say with default value. There's also a, a similar method called with default, where it will pass you the key, and you can pick what you want the default value it to be so for it to be. In yeah, you, you can have a function that will return different defaults for different keys. So cool. we don't need a multi map because you, you can just do it with that. Nice. So we should move the this is the, the official Scala IDE plugin for Eclipse. But sorry, that's not, that's not multi-map in that case. Yeah. That's, that, this is no, it's not, no, but you but can do it if you just make the default value be an empty list. Yeah. OK. And then did you have to do mapc.add or whatever, the .append or whatever the Yeah. Okay. Right. But you don't have to do that. 
but you never have to check if it wasn't there because yeah. you've right. got an empty list. Cool. Neat. So let me go to. So, I'll give you guys a problem now. So, we have a list of words, and we want to get a list of lists of words with all of the anagrams together. And we don't care about short words. So, here's the example. Kitchen and thicken are anagrams. The, we don't care about because it's too short. A-B-A-B-A-B -A -B -A -B and B-A-B-A-B-A -A are anagrams. And testing is off on its own. So, I'll give you a few minutes to solve that. And <laughs> One tip, so you can think of how you would do it in Java just with regular loops and whatever, and then replace what parts of that you can with the functions that you've learned, if you have time. And I'll give you a, a quick tip, which is that an easy way of checking if uh, strings are anagrams is if you sort the characters in that string. So you can assume that you can do that. So ABABAB becomes AAABBB, which is the same as BABABA sorted. So that's an easy way of checking if they're anagrams. So I'll give you a few minutes to try to solve it. So this is the full Scala solution. You take your words, filter to get only the ones that are long enough that we care about, group by the sorted value of it, and then what we have is a map of you know AAABBB to a list of both of those anagrams. And then what we can do is throw away the keys, and you just take the values. Do you have that in Java? So, so no, I didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what is the? Why didn't you need to to make it uh, to make the like to make all of the stuff sorted in lowercase and all that stuff? All the stuff sorted in lowercase. Like for example, you had kitchen and like if you if you are function on string. I didn't deal with case. You didn't deal with case there. Okay, but yeah. that has a, does that look like question. a lower? Uppercase K for the first kitchen. No. no? Kind of okay. looks like, but no, that, so they're, they're all lowercase. So, okay, yes, okay. if they were uppercase, then yes, you would map to lowercase first. Or that would be one way of doing it at least. So, so in this case, uh, if you go back, uh, go back to please to the next page. What what is uh, sort dot sorted there? Is that like an extra function that strings have in Scala? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, kind of an extra function that strings have. So I will <laughs> delegate to uh, to Christian. He's going to teach you exactly how that happens. But for now, just yes, a string can be treated as a collection of characters. So you can do anything on it that you want that you can do on other stuff like sorting oh, it. Or that's where it came from. Yes, so. You said earlier strings are Java Lang strings. But they are. But that's not a method we get on Java Lang strings. <laughs> no, it's not. You don't get it. <laughs> Scala users I get it. Scala Scala strings. Strings, no. <laughs> nope, they are java.lang strings. Really? Yep, you're going to find out how. I mean, Groovy has like, geez, like Groovy G strings. strings yeah. yep. G Scala has a way of doing it. <laughs> um, yes, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a string get class. It's just java.lang string, but we can do string.sorted, and we get it back. You can also do uh, filter. So let's see. What's, uh, this is all just string bonus stuff. String dot. What? Yeah. No, that's just string dot get class. So, so string oh, string dot. Now you're you're not gonna catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! It's Java dot lang string. Still the same. So we can do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Oops. Um, just in case. Thing that can create all the trouble. It's called the compiler. <laughs> Oh, is Zapper. upper. Anything that can surprise Fine. You. So you can, I have a string, and you can do all this stuff like you do on a collection, like filter and map and all that kind of cool stuff. So uh, you'll, what, you'll, what, what, what exactly is the definition of sorted for a string? It sorts, makes them lowercase and sorts them? It doesn't make them lowercase. It just sorts them is based on it? the ASCII value or the Unicode value. Sorry. It's it just sorts them based on the Unicode value when you were sorting. It, it just yeah. it sorts them based on right. character dot compare to other character. Is that sorted a 
method on string or on call? You're going to find out later. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up next? Oh, collections continued. Good. So I'm going to show you something else. Let's say we have a bunch of data, the numbers 1 to 10. Um, this is another one of those things that you will find out later Does how it's done. Two is a method on integer. Two is a method on integer, kind of. You'll find out later from Christian. Okay. <laughs> and let's say that we have a function that takes a long time to do. So could you write that? So are you saying could you write that one dot two? Yes, you could. I'll change okay. that for right. you. Yeah, I see. Okay. All right. okay. They're equivalent. That reminds me of Groovy. And that's just because, in general, in Java, you can invoke functions um, without using dot and the brackets just by having a space in between them. So 1, 2, 10 is the same as 1.2, 10. And in fact, even for numbers, if you do 1 plus 3, that's really calling the function plus on 1. So it's 1 dot plus 3. Anyway. Is plus there spelled out, or is it the ASCII? Plus. Nope, the uh, ASCII plus. Okay. So that compiles. Got it. Uh, let me make that a little bit shorter. So we're going to multiply the number by 2, but first we're going to delay for a while. It treats all exceptions as unchecked exceptions. So what happens if that throws interrupted exception? It gets thrown. Doesn't call thread.interrupt. It just gets thrown like a regular exception, okay. like a regular unchecked so exception. Okay. It just comes out until wherever it was caught. Um, what was I going to do? Right. So we mapped the calculation, and you see it takes a long time to do because we're sleeping in between. So if I wanted to speed this up, what I can do is I can make a new thread pool executor. I can pass a task for each calculation in there. It'll e execute them all concurrently. I get them back, and then you have to make sure that you get them in the right order so that we end up with over here things, well, things over there. Or I can do this if I can get to the right place. Dot par. Ooh. <laughs> so let me show that again, because it went by pretty quick. Executes them in groups of four, because what dot par does is it gives me back a parallel version of whatever kind of collection I have. So you can do this for a list, or a map, or a set, or anything that you have. Uh, it's using, it defaults to a thread pool or a fork join executor of however many cores you have on the machine. Could so. you execute it once again? Pardon? Just run it once again, please. Sure. We had an awesome bug in our framework yeah, for a deadlock that you had one for. <laughs> Four out of time. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> did. <laughs> it, took, it took like two months to find that. <laughs> And that's just the default, so however many cores you have. But if you want, you can change it to, you can pass it a different um, task executor, I think it's called. And it will just use however many threads you tell it to use. Let's see. So I wanted to learn some Java 8 stuff. So I found a blog post that had a bunch of Java 8 samples. Because you've seen pattern matching now, so you know that Java 8 won't have that kind of stuff. But at least it will have some of these kinds of things. Yeah, you can, you can and I wanted to see how good it would be. So if I can get to it. So here's an example that I found on a blog. We have a list of names of people's last names, and we have a list of people. And what we want to do is find the people whose name contains Smith or Adams or Crawford, one of those names. And I won't make you solve it this time. This is just the, the solution they gave on the blog, which is we, do, we want to call filter on people. That's, in general, what we want to do. But java.util.list doesn't have a filter method. Instead, you have to convert it to a stream. So you call stream, you call filter. And the condition we want to do is we want to go through each of the names that we have and see if the person's name contains that name. So we, 
you can use the any match method on names.stream. This is equivalent to the exists method that I taught you about earlier. So we do names.stream.anyMatch, p.name.contains, or colon colon contains. And then at the end, you have a stream, but you want to get back to a list. So you have to call collect, and you have to pass in the kind of list that you want to get back. So this is what Java 8 actually looks like. Lots of stuff here that it is does have unnecessary. A map method, but I guess you can't use it in this case. A map method on this? <laughs> yeah, there is a map method that, that we're calling filter though, and any right. any match. That probably takes away the map. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a few things that I think are kind of redundant in this. The first is the return type. I'm used to Scala, so that gets inf inferred from yeah. the type of the expression. We have to call stream here twice to get something that we can call harder functions on. And then at the end, we have to call collect and collectors.toList in order to get back an actual list instead of a stream. So if you take away all of that redundant stuff, you get Scala. People.filter, names.exists, p.name.contains. Nice and clean. So you can kind of make the Java 8 stuff look a little bit more like Scala if you kind of cheat. And you can do this in simple examples, but not really in your production code. What you can do is if you assume that you're always starting with a stream of things, then you can get rid of a lot of this stuff. But really, in regular usage, you're probably not going to have a stream to start with. You're going to have a list or a map or a set, and you're probably going to want to end up with one of those too. So you will end up having to call all this stream and collect stuff. They had some reason they didn't want to add all of those methods to collection. Yeah, I don't know the reason, but they added a few, but not many. Yeah, it was a very deliberate decision that they split it all out into, into the stream. Hmm. It yeah. might have been for code reuse, maybe, because otherwise you have to make a different implementation of each of them for set and map and list and every kind of collection. Uh, Instead, no, you because they added they default added methods default. interfaces. Yeah, but list and map and set don't share a parent interface, do they? Collection. Well, map doesn't, but list and set do. Hmm. Map is, uh, is separate from collection. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I forget. But yeah. Find out, I really want to know. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's. And it's this is especially bad. It's like a conscious compromise, but yeah, it definitely pollutes all the code. I think you can save against. that collect. I think there's something that'll return. How does it know what kind of collection I want, though? Um, a set or a list? It'll return you like an unsafe collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is kind of bad here, but it's even worse. It, it gets even worse if you just want to call like one method. So if we. The other examples I was showing where it was number.map underscore times two, instead that would be numbers.stream.map, you know, n times two dot collect, collectors dot two list. Really weird, cause, like, cause I'm used to Groovy now and yeah. everything's a Yeah, Groovy does that too, it augments all the collections yeah. with hmm. streamability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, next thing. <coughs> So, <laughs> null sucks. Option is better, although still not perfect. There's a lot of problems with uh, null. So the biggest one is that you can get a null pointer exception. So it sounds kind of weird to point it out, but if you never use null, then you never get a null pointer exception. But you still need to use something. So in Scala, the convention is to use option. Option is a collection, kind of like a <laughs> list, but it can only ever contain at most one element. So it's either empty or it's full. So let me show you how it works. Let's do So you can make an option just by passing in something into the option method, kind of and you get back an option of that. Let me show you another one. What happens if it's null? And I have to specify the type here for an unimportant reason that won't actually happen in real code. So option has two subclasses, sum and none. So if you 
actually have a value in there, then you get the subclass sum. Otherwise, you get none. So now that we have it, you can do stuff with it. So because option is like a collection class, you can do a lot of the stuff that I showed you before. You can call filter, you can call um, exists, you can call all that stuff. Probably the more common one to call, no, I'm just going to type filter. The, um, one of the more common ones you would want to call is map. So if we want to get the age from this option, you can call map and we can add five to it. And we get back an option of an int. So I can use that exact same code. on an option that happens to be none, or what would have been null. And it still works. You still get back an option of an int, but now it's just none. So what you would actually do with this, though, usually is you want to call something that takes an int. So to get back an int, you can provide a default value. So you can do it like this. You call get or else, and you pass in some default value. And because we already had one, it just gives us the value that we already had. So If we call it one on one that's none, then we get back our default value. Does, this, does, this, does that have anything to do with option, what you just did? Or what part? Get or else. So get or else is a specific method on option. Because it's an option. Yep. Okay. Map and the other stuff is just because it's a collection. Get or else is the option specific one. So what happens if you call h2.get without anything? You get an exception? So yes, age2 does have a get method. Options have a get method, but we don't use it because you can throw an exception. The, the more common way of doing it, so you can also do pattern matching with it. So if we have an option of something, you can do that option match, and then you either do case sum, and you pass in the value, or case none. So it's kind of an alternative. Or the more common thing would be you just map to transform it, and then you end up with some default value. So this is to replace code like this. So if we had a method where it gives back a person and it might be null, using nulls or using Java, we would do a null check and then you return the person's age. Otherwise, you would return your default value. In Scala, with the option, it looks more like this. Does Scala have a way of prohibiting a thing that returns an option from returning null? Or do you just have to trust the people who? No, you just have to trust them. But it is a convention that so th this is the other uh, useful part about option. Turn a null from a thing that, an option. that would be especially bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you had something that returned an option and you returned null, because the the benefit of option is that it lets you signal that a method might not return something. So in Java, when you're coding and you're writing some stuff and you think that a method might return null, then you have to go and you have to look in the Java doc if it's a document method, or you look in the code to see if it's null. Or if you're lazy, you just add in a null check anyway. Is, or there, a way, is there a way or a reason to check if it's null or some, or none or some? If you wanted to, so if we wanted to you know, do the equivalent of a null check and then print out you know, your ages, whatever, and in the case where it's not there, we want to print out you you know, there was no person, yeah. you might do pattern matching for that, because then you would just have the two cases. How does that work? Can you show? Sure. Switch. Match is the replacement for switch. Match. Um, oops. Um, so Scala libraries generally promise not to return null from anything? What they do is, if you return some object like person, then you're going to get a non-null object like that. Okay. If it might return null, then instead they return option. Right. So let's So we get here is person. Is that like case sum and none, like an instance of? 
Like kind of, but it's more powerful. So okay. pattern match. Yeah, it's pattern matching, which is the this part is just like an instance of check, okay. but it does more. So you could say some underscore if you didn't care about the person. But it, it's if we didn't care, first, yeah. But because I'm using it, we can't. Always gonna be like a class. This. Well, that like class it can be. Uh, it doesn't have to be a class. You can do other stuff. So pattern matching, we've showed you case classes. And what that does is it automatically does what it needs to do so that you can use it in pattern matching. Okay. But that's something that you can do on your own too, independent from case classes. They're just syntactic sugar to do it easily. So I can show you. Um, Like what, what does this match so, thing do exactly? Give me a sec to type this out, and then so .r is kind of like a method on string, which we'll get to later. Um, I think this is probably going to confuse you more than it's going to help, but I'll show it anyway. <laughs> Find. It's kind of a method of string. So this probably doesn't really explain anything to you, but it's cool. So that uh, you can do this kind of pattern matching thing on the side here. So actually, I'll show it to you in a more pattern matching way. No, it doesn't. It takes a, the thing that can match. So oh, okay. for now, I'll, I'll just show this, that there are other ways of, doing, of using pattern matching that don't involve case classes. You can make them on your own. It happens to have a method called R, which will give you something that you can match against, which lets you do that kind of thing. But you can do all this stuff on your own. You don't have to use case classes or any specific if stuff. I squint, I can almost understand that now. Yeah. What's, what's with the triple quotes? That is so that I don't have to escape things. So because otherwise, that backslash, I would have to do too. And it's really useful for regular expressions, because you do that kind of thing all the time. So I don't, I don't know if that helped anything, but well, there it is. I mean, sum and yeah. none is one of those util matching regex, right? Nope, sum and none are subclasses of option. Mm -hmm. But what's something down there? Like something is a. Something is a yeah. Something is a kind of regular expression. It is. It's a. This one is a Scala like regular expression. Something about some none and something <coughs> all have some base thing. No, and what's that base thing? They don't have a base thing. They just implement a method. Fine, I'll I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what they have is uh, there's a method called unapply that you can make. So unapply. And what it does is it takes as a parameter the thing up here that you are passing in. And as a result, this part is going to confuse you even more, but as a result, it will give you back an option of the things that you want over here. And the reason why it gives an option is because if you don't want it to match against that thing, then you return none. If you want it to match against the thing that you were passed, it will return some of a tuple of two things in this case. Is that, is that an example of a monad? No. So if it's some, it'll just print line. And if it's none, yep. it won't. Right. OK. Option. So it pretty much does the same thing as the maybe monad. Right? Oh, the, the option, yes. Yeah. We've got about 50. OK, sorry, option, yes. I thought you meant the uh, regular expression matching stuff that I was doing. 
Yeah. We've got about 15 minutes until we have to evacuate for the musical act that follows Scala. Okay. This is better than, yeah, totally better. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just give me one second. Yeah. I'll show you one cool thing, which is I tried to make an option class in Java after I learned about it, and it doesn't really work for a bunch of different reasons. Or it works OK, but for example, you can't have a get or else method that's as flexible as the, uh, the Java one. But the other thing that you can do is if I if I do that, it's hard to see, but there's a delay. But if I was to do that over here, I won't bother showing you for time there wouldn't be any delay at all because that's actually passed lazily to the method. So you don't have to worry about performance implications about if there's some long calculation there. doesn't really matter. This is actually kind of cool, so I'll show you it. I can't resist. That means that I can actually do, oh, that one is the wrong one. I can actually do that. And it won't throw it because it was passed lazily, so it never actually gets executed. So I'll pass back to Christian to explain all the stuff you were asking earlier. <laughs> I'll just leave mine here. Yeah. Excellent. OK. So no, we can't explain all this stuff, but we can talk after. Um, we're running out of time. But one thing I want to quickly answer is um, Donnie invoked the two method and an integer. And he also invoked a method on string that is actually not on string. We saw that. And that's kind of mysterious. So I want to do that too, because it's mysterious. Um, so let's define a string. Um, let's use John Smith again. What I want to be able to do is simply uh, get the substring after a character. So say I want the substring after the space, so I want Smith. There is no substring after method on Java lang string. So we could simply add one. Like there is utilities for this. So let's import um, Apache, what's it, um, commons, lang string utils. This has a substring after method. Now I'm defining a class called the rich string. It takes a string. And I'll give it a method, a method I'm missing, call it substring after. It itself takes a separator, which is a string. And all it does, it will say string utils. Again, that's the nice thing. We're interacting with a Java method. You say string utils. Oops, sorry. Where did substring after? I don't see it. Oh, oh, it's after last. I don't know why I'm not seeing it. Oh, there it is. Saying string separator. So of course, what I could do now, oh, that makes me answer another question that Jonathan had earlier. There's another keyword, object. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the um, companion object of a class. And in Java, where you would define a static method, for instance, that's where this will go. And it's also one of your favorite type of objects, Jonathan. It's a single thing. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the root of all evil. <laughs> so I define a method string to rich string. Yes. It takes a string. And it will simply, um, you know, don't have to type this, but I'll do it anyway. It will return a rich string for that string. So now what I could do with my string is say which string invoke that static method. Say string to rich name. Have a substring after method all of a sudden. And pass in the name. So okay, you can do that pretty much anywhere. You can wrap a type in another type. Um, but what I wanted to be able to do originally is say name dot substring after. I wanted to be able to say. Why did you pass in a space? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yes, of course. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Yes, you're right. I'm going there. I just don't compile right now because I wanted to type something that doesn't compile. So there, here's our Smith. But what we really want to be able to do is this or this. Right, so we want to invoke a method on that string directly without converting it to another type, which is exactly what Donnie did when he said number one dot two or string dot, what was it? Sorted, string dot sorted. So what we can do is, first of all, let me import, I'll explain that in a second, my rich string here. <coughs> so it still doesn't compile, obviously. But what we can do is we can mark this as implicit. And this is where the mystery comes from. And that just tells the yeah. compiler to look for that implicit conversion. So it looks for how can I convert that type you're invoking a method on to another type that has that method. Is this why the compiler takes a long time? <laughs> this, might be, this might be one of the reasons. Okay. And this feature is used a lot. For instance, let's say you have a, an enterprise application and you have a lot of entities in there and you all want them to be serializable to JSON. You could add another char in there that defines all that implicits that adds to JSON from JSON to all your entities. And uh, there's a lot of frameworks out there that make use of that technology and it's also, or that feature, and there's also a lot of internals that uh, work that way. So it's an implicit conversion. Um, and the rules for how they are discovered are really involved and I can claim to understand them. Sounds like a lot of work. Everybody's like just find it. Like it's just, just find the. Time. So it's only things in scope. So only things you can export it there. First of all, what's object? Yeah. Any other part? It's a companion object to a class. So everywhere in Java where you have static methods, that's where that will go. It's a singleton instance. It's one object of that type. It acts as if you would call that. So it's easy to see. Yeah. Actually, that's not. So his ID doesn't do it, but newer ones, it will actually undermine the thing that is being implicitly converted. Okay. So you can so it's basically it's like trying to expose <coughs> dense cloud with static methods. No, that, so no. ignore it. the method. You could throw an exception in the, like instead of new string, you, you could throw an exception. Right, well. You could throw an exception in the. Sure, so what, what is your question, though? I'm, well, I'm guessing, anyway, like, well, why do you need objects? Like, why wouldn't you? It's a static method. It's basically... Uh, like, it, why can't that implicit be in class rich string? Because we don't have an instance of rich string. We want the compiler to automatically create an instance for this. Okay, right? so... Yeah, try that, actually. Throw throw an exception inside of substring after. Not Here? there, but no, no, inside of the below. method substring yeah. after. You want to throw me? Yeah, throw something me? there. And we should see the rich string getting created in the stack. You won't see it being created. Oh, no, we'll see the call, we'll so call into it. <coughs> there. Uh, rich string, yeah, OK. So we saw where the method was. It made the instance and then it called it. Yeah. But we can talk about this more after. Yeah. I just have to pass back to Donnie because there's some yeah, really yeah. nice things to show. So how much time do we have? I don't know, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK. Don't have time for that. So I've been using Scala at work for about a year now. And this is how I introduced it. So starting a couple of years ago, I made just kind of an independent project that wasn't part of our production code. And kind of part of the culture of where I work is that if you were doing stuff on the main project, then there was no question. It was just you did it all in Java at the time. 
But if you were doing something that wasn't part of the main project, something that ran on the build system or wasn't really production code, it doesn't really matter what you do it in. So usually we would use Java, but if people wanted to use something else just to try it, they could. So we had a couple of Python projects, we had a couple of Ruby projects, I made a couple of Scala projects. As I was doing this, I was pairing with other people so that they were kind of fami familiar with Scala and learning it a little bit. And I was posting stuff on our internal wiki about it. I think the key part where the sentiment changed was when I did the free dev day. This was a day where all developers could work on whatever they wanted and we all just presented it at the end of the day. So I made our main project a mixed Scala and Java project and I showed how I converted a, a few classes from, Scala, from Java to Scala. And I showed it in a couple of different styles. So I showed a couple where I made them really, really short, like a third of the length of the Java. And I still had uh, Java unit tests for the Scala classes. So they were literally the exact same thing, but just a third of the length. That made people see how cool it could be. But I did another, another couple where I did what's called the Java and Scala style, where I just did, I didn't use any Scala features at all. I just did a line for line conversion from Java to Scala. And it looks pretty much the exact same, except you use you know, def instead of how you normally declare methods and that kind of thing. So a few months passed because I was busy at work, and so I didn't do much work on it. But I was getting other people to learn it as we went, did a couple of more projects. And then finally, in December, I added it to the main project. And I did it in a really conservative way. So because Scala just compiles to bytecode, what I did was initially, I just put all of that code into a jar and then committed that into the project. So nobody else even needed to have the Scala, the Scala ID. You just put it in a jar and commit that. So I waited for a little while for that to go out. And I, the first class I converted was some admin page that only developers had access to that they didn't even use. So I just wanted it to go out in production and make sure that it all worked. Unsurprisingly, it all worked. It is, you experimented on production? I didn't experiment on production. I did the conversion, and I sent one class out after I had already tested it. Really, keep in mind that doing this kind of deployment, or that, this kind of thing, all you're doing is adding a jar to your existing project. You're not making any kind of other changes. It's just literally the same trouble or risk as adding any jar to your project. So after that worked, a little while later, I got a few more people to start uh, coding in Scala. And part of my plan was a way of backing out of this change too. So this is really easy in Scala because if you, wanted to, if you had a mixed Scala and Java project, you would introduce a few Scala classes, but you wanted to back out, you can do it because you just put all those in a jar, you commit the jar, and then nobody has to have the ID, nobody, nobody has to worry about that. If you wanted to make changes to it, you could either convert the classes back to Java or make a small change and recompile it. So it's really easy to back out if you wanted to. And that was why I did uh, that stuff initially. And also for this time, I was writing unit tests in Java to make it even easier if we wanted to back out. So new production code in Scala, unit tests in Java still. So this is what it looked like there. So starting early last year, we had about 10 Scala files, just a few that had been made, going up to 700. The, the number of Scala files are on the right. We still have a ton of Java files. We have around 12,000. And you can see in the beginning, we did a really gradual change. So people, as they got familiar with, Java, with Scala, they started coding more and more in it. But initially, they were still writing new stuff. As time went on, they got more and more comfortable. They stopped writing new, new Java files. And then we even started getting rid of them because we were converting them to Scala because we like it better. And by the way, this intersection point has no meaning at all. <laughs> uh, I ran this graph six months ago, and the intersection point is still about that place. That's just where it shows up. So a few benchmarks. Jonathan mentioned that the Scala compiler is slow. And it is a lot slower. So we had about 850,000 lines of Java. That takes 14 seconds to do a full compile. We have 23,000 lines of Scala. That takes 51 seconds to do a full compile. That's not exactly a fair comparison because the Scala compiler has to read in all the Java code. So it has to read and parse 870,000 lines of code. But it still is going to be much, much slower. Luckily, that doesn't really matter much because you have the incremental compiler. So when you save a file, even in Java, it doesn't recompile everything. It just recompiles what it needs to. Same thing happens in Scala. So this is really the number that matters. It's how long it takes when you're actually using it, which is about one to two seconds. That's the vast majority of the time. So I think one of the things I could have done differently, <clears throat> the way I taught the people on the team was mainly through pairing with them, 
and doing code reviews. I did a few kind of more structured learning things where every once in a while I would give kind of a 10 or 15 minute talk where there was a new Scala feature that I wanted to use, so I would teach everybody else about it. But really, I didn't teach in any kind of structured way, and that was because everybody was at a different skill level, so I didn't think it was worth it. I think I really should have anyway. A few of the different ways that you can introduce Scala. So we did it with an existing project converting into mixed Scala and Java. That works really well because you can do it really gradually. So there's no point where you ever have your team productivity go down really low because just as people are comfortable with it, they can switch over. One of the bad sides is that it is kind of annoying in the Java side interacting with some of the Scala stuff or just in going back and forth. You have a Scala list or you have an option, but on the Java side, you need a Java list or a null. You don't really want to compromise your Scala code, but you still need to use it anyway. So you end up having to do a bit of work and it just makes it a little bit annoying. If you're doing that, I would recommend doing all the work in Java, even though it's easier to in Scala. That way, when you get rid of the Java, you're left with nice, uncompromised Scala, Scala code. The other way of doing it is with a brand new component or project, and that's just the flip side. So everybody has to learn it, or everybody who's working on it has to learn it, but you get to use Scala to the full, and you don't have any of that annoying stuff. Another interesting way is you can do only tests. So take any project, an existing project or a new project, and write all of your production code in Java, but then just write unit tests in Scala. And that can work well because all the crappy code that you write initially, that isn't, you know, because you don't know Scala very well, it doesn't end up going out to production. So it's not ideal that you have bad test code, but maybe it's better than having bad production code. But there's a couple of big disadvantages, which is that you won't get to use a lot of Scala stuff because you're constantly just interacting with Java and all you're doing in your test is just calling a few Java methods. So you don't really get to see a lot of the benefit of it. But it might be easier because that might be the only way that you can introduce it. So I think one of these two is the better way, but if you get completely blocked on that, then you can at least fall back on you know, requesting, at least you can do tests in Scala to learn it. So I'll just leave with the comment that I remember a few years ago before I had known Scala, I had heard stories about Java developers learning Scala and they all liked it. And I spent some time and I looked into it and looked at code samples and saw that, you know, some of it is shorter and it's nice, but really that there wasn't anything I saw that you could do in Java, or sorry, in Scala that you couldn't do in Java. It just might be a bit longer. So I didn't think that there was really much benefit in learning Scala. But I was wrong. There, there's a huge benefit to learning Scala. It's, it's not just shorter, it really is better at basically everything. So I don't know what to tell you to convince you, but if that's your reason for not learning it, that you think that it's just shorter and whatever, just take my word for it that it really is better and you should learn it. you have anything to add? Okay, <laughs> thanks for listening.